Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn some game theory. Today's topic is forward induction. I cover this in lesson 2.8 of Game Theory 101, the complete textbook. You can check the video description for more information about that. Now throughout this unit, we've been solving extensive form games by using backward induction. And the basic idea with backward induction is that we're assuming all future play will be rational. In other words, at the end of the game, the last player to move will choose the option that gives him or her the best expected utility. And so we can figure out what the best move is for the previous player based off of that information, based off of the fact that if the last player to move is acting strategically, then they'll pick the thing that's best for them. They'll do the thing that's rational in the future. And I should base my decision today based off of what's rational for him in the future and so forth. And so we can just take that logic and move all the way up the entire game tree and solve for the optimal moves at the beginning based off of what is going to be rational in the future. So that's not an unreasonable assumption. It seems pretty obvious and intuitive that if players are acting strategically, then they'll be making the rational best moves in the future. But what if we look at this the other way around? What if instead of just looking at backward induction and assuming that all future play will be rational, that once we're in the future, we assume that all past play was rational? Is that going to do something different than what backward induction would do for us? And the answer is going to be yes. And to figure this out and to see how this is the case, let's talk about the stag hunt. We should remember this from way back in the very early parts of Unit 1 when we were looking at strategic form games. So remember that this is the game we actually introduced Nash Equilibrium with, and there are two pure strategy Nash Equilibria. There's the stag-stag Nash Equilibrium and the rabbit-rabbit Nash Equilibrium. So basically the players just want to match up on what they're doing. Any equilibrium is when they're both choosing the same option, either it's stag-stag or rabbit-rabbit. And remember that the stag-stag one is better for both of them but that doesn't change the fact that this is still mutually optimal where they can't individually change their strategies and do better. If the other guy is hunting a rabbit, then you should want to hunt a rabbit as well. Now we can look at this in terms of an extensive form game. This is the exact same game as we saw in the strategic form. It's just now we have it in the form of a game tree. So player one is still choosing whether to hunt a stag or a rabbit, and player two, because of this dashed line, that's indicating that player two doesn't know whether player one hunted a stag or a rabbit when she moves, and she's also choosing to hunt a stag or a rabbit. And these payoffs here are exactly the same as what we saw in the strategic form game. So there's still two pure strategy Nash equilibria here. There's the stag-stag equilibrium and the rabbit-rabbit equilibrium. Now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to add a move for player one at the beginning of the game. That move is never going to be chosen in equilibrium, so that move is not going to be optimal for player one, and yet nevertheless, the presence of that move is going to remove one of the Nash equilibria that we talked about down here, and so what's going to happen is there's going to be a single unique equilibrium to the game just by adding a move to player one strategy set that player one is never going to actually ever want to play. So let's see this. I'm going to call this the pub hunt. So player one has an option of not only hunting a stag or a rabbit, but at the beginning of the game, he could choose to go to the pub, and as player two is walking out to the hunting range, she'll see him at the pub, they'll join up, and they'll both get 2.5 points of utility here. So that's better than any of the other outcomes other than hunting a stag for both players. So the basic drama here for player two is that player two, when she makes her move, doesn't know whether player one has hunted a stag or a rabbit. So imagine player one chooses one of those things, player two only knows that he didn't go to the pub. He, she doesn't know whether he's hunting a stag or a rabbit. So she's essentially playing a guessing game here where she would want to hunt a rabbit if she knew that player one was hunting a rabbit, and she would want to hunt a stag if player one or, or she knew that player one was hunting a stag. But what's interesting is the presence of this move, this go to the pub move for player one, allows player two to infer exactly what player one did if player one chose to go hunting, whether it's a stag or a rabbit. So to see why, look at player one's payoffs here. If he hunts a rabbit, then the best he can possibly do is earn two. So if he hunts a rabbit and player two hunts a stag, the best he can possibly do is get two. The other option is he'll get one by player two hunting a rabbit as well. But either way, that's still worse than this two that uh, he's going to get if he hunts a rabbit and player two hunts a stag. So regardless of his choice, or regardless of player two's choice in response to player one's choice of hunting a rabbit, that payoff for player one is going to be worse than what player one would get if he went to the pub. Going to the pub gives him 2.5, and that's greater than anything he could possibly get by hunting a rabbit. 
So what does that mean? Well, imagine player two has the chance to move. So now we're looking at player two's move here. Player two only knows that player one did not go to the pub. So that means player one has given up the choice of getting 2.5. He could have locked in that payoff. He could have taken his 2.5 points, washed his hands, and been done with the whole situation. But by having player two have the choice of moving, she knows that player one has chosen not to go to the pub. So player one has willingly declined to earn 2.5. Well, that means he couldn't have wanted to hunt a rabbit. If we're assuming that all past play was rational, it can't possibly be rational for player one to have hunted a rabbit in this situation, because the best he can possibly do from that is worse than if he just accepted that 2.5. And so that means player two knows that player one chose to hunt a stag, because rabbit here just doesn't make sense. There's no way or any type of situation or outcome where hunting this rabbit is better than going to the pub. And so that means player two now knows that player one is hunting a stag, and so she can choose whether to hunt a stag based off of that information. Hunting a stag gets her three, hunting a rabbit gets two, so if player one is going to be hunting a stag, player two is obviously going to want to hunt, want to hunt the stag as well. So that means if player two has this opportunity to move, she knows that player one has chosen stag, and she should choose a stag as well. All right, well, think about this now from player one's perspective. If he goes hunting, then player two knows that he's chosen a stag, and so she'll choose a stag, and he will earn three. In contrast, he could go to the pub and lock in 2.5, but 2.5 is less than three. Player one should want to hunt a stag. And so as a result, we have a unique solution here where both players are hunting stags, and there's no miscommunication, there's no discoordination. Player two is always correctly able to infer player one's move, and it's all because we've added this, this go-to-the-pub strategy, which never ended up being played in equilibrium. And that's what forward induction allowed us to figure out. The idea here that players in the past have made rational moves allows player two to make this correct inference and they can end up in this better outcome with certainty. So that's the idea with forward induction. I think it's a really neat concept, and at least in this case, it was intuitive. However, and I talk about this a lot in the last section of chapter two and section 2.8 of the textbook, if we really look deep into this forward induction solution concept, what we do is we start out with intuitive solutions like this, and then you can very quickly come up with strange and really counterintuitive solutions, which are still based in forward induction. And so forward induction is a little bit more controversial than backward induction is for that reason, but uh, you'll really have to look through the textbook there because there's a lot of examples where it just goes increasingly crazy and, and perhaps unrealistic depending upon your perspective. Either way, this video wraps up this entire unit on extensive form games. And so starting in the next video, we'll move on to a completely different topic. It's going to be advanced strategic form games. So I hope you enjoyed this unit, and I hope you join me in the next unit. See you then. Take care.